Okay, guys. So the good thing is I will make this uh, as painless for y'all as possible since we're a small crowd. Maybe we can make it a little bit more interactive um, and go from there. There is a lot of information. Um, a lot has changed in the last five years, um, and especially since we caught it down. We've had this new dual source technology that's being installed upstairs as we speak. Um, really, you know, a lot of technology and principles I've had to even relearn. So um, we'll get going. So as you'll learn throughout the course of these lectures, cardiac CT can have, you know, uh, really provide comprehensive assessment for your patients, a lot of which we're going to be discussing at later part of time points. But what is the purpose of today's talks? Really, this is just the basics of the CT scanner. We'll talk about simple things such as spatial, temporal, contrast resolution, and how we actually go about making a picture. Um, so first thing I have to do is we kind of have to compare it to radi radiography. What is radiography? Well, if you look at this classic, you know, uh, uh, two-dimensional x-ray, what you have is different densities um, um, being superimposed upon. You know, the heart, the, the human body is a 3D structure, right? And with the 2D plane films, you're compressing this 2D structure into, uh, this 3D structure into a 2D image. So what you're actually seeing is that for each density in the image, it's really a super, you know, uh, uh, it, it's really the accumulation of uh, uh, structures above and beyond that uh, uh, that point. So how can we improve on this? Well, one of the ways is, of course, to do an AP and a lateral. This kind of helps you differentiate uh, and remove some of the overlapping of the heart, um, uh, 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 of the different structures of the heart. So now you're able to kind of more better spatially localize uh, what particular object you're seeing. Well, you know, really this led to the concept of CT. Well, you know, if, if, one, if two projections were better than one, well, what if we had multiple projections? And this concept was, you know, first developed in 1917 by this Dr. Radon, um, and this idea was very simple, and he won a Ro Nobel Peace Prize for it, I mean, Nobel Prize for this, where basically if we were to create multiple projections, you would be able to systematically represent the original uh, object, um, and we'll show you how that is done. So uh, let's just go over a little bit about the basics of uh, a CT machine. Uh, you have, uh, you know, you have of course the motorized table, you have an x-ray source, um, you have the patient in the middle and the bore of the, c uh, the camera, and on the opposite end of the x-ray source you have what are known as the x-ray detectors. Um, rays of projection of radiation is transmitted through the patient, and in current day scanners this is in a cone-shaped fashion, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more as to why that's important. And you can think of CT as really, you know, if you have a, a, a loaf of bread, you're creating axial 2D images, so you're, you, you, so you can, you know, as if you're looking at it, each individual slice of a loaf of bread. And so the images that you see, this axial projection, is, um, is just a particular slice location or slab of this patient's 3D um, anatomy. And this is just a quick um, important events that happened with CT. Uh, main thing is names that you should know are people like Hounsfield and Cormac. These were the ones who won the Nobel Prize for development of CT. One thing I'd like to point out, similar to MRI, is if you look at the years, you know, these were, this was in the 70s this work was done. So really this is not, a, you know, a old technology. In fact, this is, you know, a recent and um, uh, not too long ago. So uh, there's two different types of CT machines. One is called, the one you're more familiar with, is called a single source CT. And this is where you classically have one x-ray tube which goes around the patient and one set of detector arrays. Compare this to what we now have upstairs with the new Siemens dual source CT where you have two detector heads both at 90 degrees of each other and with two sets of detectors. 
Um, and the concepts, um, and you know, what else is a CT machine made up of? This is just a little bit of uh, more detail. You have an X-ray tube. You've got detectors on the other side of it. These are what is called, these detectors are what we call solid state detectors. They're made of cesium um, tungsten material. Uh, if you remember in the last parts of Dr. Mamarian's talk, these new CZT nuclear cameras, it's kind of the same technology where you have, once you have produced an X-ray, it interacts with the body with um, creating a photon electric effect. This electron effect creates visible light, which is detected by these photodiodes, and an electrical signal is created. Now, uh, these detectors are arranged in a certain manner, um, in rows, and it's actually this arrangement of the detectors which actually <coughs> defines the, um, um, what kind of you know, um, um, CT scanner we're dealing with. For example, a lot of these different types of scanners have different arrangements of these detectors, which kind of define, you know, um, um, what, what the, 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 the specific parameters of these machines. And here's just a quick summary with some of the newer CT scanners on board. Most of them you'll see are traditionally have been 16, uh, 64 slice detectors. Uh, the f you know, but there are machines now that are 128 and 320 slice machines. Our Siemens is 196. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The diameter of those detectors becomes very, very important in the z-axis. It determines our z-axis resolution. In general, it's a, most of the machines are about 0 0.625 millimeters. And it's really, this is just a slide going over a little bit of discussion about collimators and detectors. You heard about collimators when we were talking about nuclear. CT has the same kind of concepts. Collimators are placed in order to help uh, shape the beam of um, x-ray that's being emanated from the, the x-ray tubes and also to prevent um, x-rays uh, from, you know, um, exciting objects that are not of interest or out of the uh, <coughs> particular field of view. These uh, x-rays also, uh, these collimators also are responsible for actually determining the, the uh, detector width that all the photons uh, land on the detector width and therefore can also be kind of responsible for z-axis resolution. Uh, if we go about, so, you know, in general, if you, you can think about each slice as one, you know, uh, we, with cardiac MRI, you had, we had talked a little bit about case space and how each time you acquired data, you filled a line in case space. This is not a truth exactly for CT, but at a basic level, you can think about it, that each time the machine goes around the patient, you create a single slice, and this is one slice of data. And as the scan is completed, you have multiple rows of data. These rows of data are then, um, similar to nuclear, undergo what's known as filtered back projection to finally create your image. Uh, filtered back projection, you know, the concept is a little bit this is exactly the same as nuclear. It's kind of what we alluded to. If you are able to take multiple projections of a structure you're interested in, you can actually recreate that structure. And this is just an example of that picture on the right-hand side using back projection. Unfortunately, the image is never as clear as the original object, and that's where the word filtered back projection comes in, is where you apply filters to help clean up the data, you can think of it that way, where you actually can reconstruct the original image. Um, and this is just another graphic, you know, if we had two projections of data, you know, you really cannot cre imagine what the image looks like, whereas if you go to 64 projections or 16 Im projections, you can see uh, where you can almost start now recreating the original object. There are newer methods of image reconstruction. Both nuclear and CT can now take advantage of iterative uh, reconstruction methods. This is a method where the computer is using 
its extensive ability to compute and kind of predicting or modeling um, uh, data. And uh, or, you know, I don't want to spend too much more time on that, but let's just say that it can be very helpful in that it improves image noise. And by improving image noise, we can actually, it's one of the methods we use to reduce, reduce radiation dose. So when we acquire these lines of data, you know, as, the, these, as these x-ray tubes and detectors are rotating around our patient, what are we actually measuring? And what we're measuring is something called the linear attenuation coefficient. Basically, you're looking at how much these x-ray beams attenuate by the time they, um, um, uh, they reach the detector surface level. And this number is given uh, a, a name uh, to what you have heard of. It's called the Hounsfield unit um, uh, for one of the founders of CT. And these Hounsfield units just rep rep simply rep rep uh, represent X-ray attenuation. Now, because CT does not have the greatest contrast resolution, you can think of each Hounsfield unit representing uh, a, certain, uh, a, a certain color on a gray scale. And, um, and so each C CT number corresponds to you know, a gray scale. And the more and more pixels you have, the more and more of these gray scales you add, and eventually you, know, you can create the entire, you, you can create an image. Um, um, so that's very important. So what exactly are we, you know, what are these Hounsfield units that we talk about? Well, um, first is you should know water is zero. So water is what everything is compared against. Something very reflective, such as bone or metal, these has Hounsfield units uh, in the hundreds to thousands range, positive 100s to positive 1000s range. Whereas air, which is uh, where x-rays can penetrate without any attenuation, you have ranges in the order of minus uh, one thousandths. In between, we have fat, and fat is usually on the range of like minus one hundred. So again, these are just how, these are very specific for various substances, and they just re represent how much of the, the CT beam is being attenuated as it transverses an object of interest. And you know, once you've scanned the patient, you've performed this filtered back projection, you're able to create uh, an actual image. So this is kind of, um, um, okay. And this just kind of goes over, you know, we've had multiple generations of CTs, and uh, you know, again, this history is not too long ago, but I think it nicely demonstrates the first generation of CTs were just, you know, pencil beam-like X-ray beams, where the motion was not a fluid circle, it actually had to, you, you know, um, um, uh, it would have to translate and rotate as it went around the patient. Uh, by the fourth generation, you are now creating what's known as those fan beam kind of x-ray uh, uh, beams. Uh, you also had what were uh, uh, the development of the slip ring technology, which allowed you to rotate in a circle the, the um, x-ray and, and, and the tube and the detectors. By the sixth generation, we were able to, instead of just taking one slice at a time, we were able to do helical CT where the table is continuously moving and you're able to scan the patient continuously. By the seventh generation, you know, we moved on from just a single slice uh, of information to many slices of information being obtained. And finally, the most recent reiteration now where you can have two sources of x-rays being produced. Um, <coughs> okay, so now this is the more, a little bit more of the clinical aspect. That's kind of how a CT image is uh, acquired and what goes on to producing an image. Now let's f specifically focus on how we do coronary imaging. You know, coronary imaging is not easy. It, you have very complex anatomy. The, these vessels can start up, start at four to five millimeters and by their t terminal ends, they can be sm as small at two millimeters. They can be very tortuous. Um, um <coughs> you have small dimensions, and these coronaries with the beating of the heart are moving. So in order to image these structures, we need a technique that has high spatial resolution, 
high temporal resolution to be able to freeze the heart. You need to be able to cover the heart quickly so, we don't, so we're not like MRI where these patients are in the scanners for 45 minutes. Uh, you want to be able to do it within a single breath hold. You want to be able to gate these images because that's very important for cardiologies uh, where we're looking for information at particular phases of the cardiac cycle. And finally, you want a technique that has good contrast resolution. And these are the five things we'll talk about next. So let's begin with EKG gating. As you know, you know, the heart is constantly moving. One of the ways we correct for the heart moving is by gating the motion of the heart to the EKG. And why this is important is because there are certain phases of the cardiac cycle where there is limited cardiac motion. There's one, the best and well known is mid-diastolic phase, but there is also a phase at the end of systole, also known as the isovolemic relaxation phase, where the heart is again still. So by having an EKG, we can actually image at these particular time points when the heart is most still. And this is just a quick example you know, of an image that was not gated, whereas if you gate the image to a phase of the uh, RR where the, you know the coronaries will be still, and you get a, you know, a coronary artery that's pristine. Temporal resolution, um, let, let's move on to temporal resolution. Temporal resolution is simply, <coughs> you know, think of it uh, as the ability to uh, resolve fast moving objects. So you all, you all have all seen pictures of you know, the hummingbird where the hummingbird beats so fast that you know, the wings just look like they're blurred because you're, you just don't have a camera that can image uh, as fast as these hummingbirds can beat their wings. Uh, where, you know, to make it a little bit more simpler, that if you were to use your regular cameras and take a picture of someone running, there's, it, there's blur. But where is it when, you know, the professional cameras, there is no blurring. They're able to, their, their shutter speeds are so fast that they can acquire um, a, a very still image. And this is really vital for coronary imaging because we have to be able to image when the heart is still, and, and this is usually a very short period of time. So we need a machine that can acquire these images in a very, very short period of time, or a very short temporal resolution. There's a couple of ways this is achieved. Uh, we'll go over these. Uh, the most, the one that is most commonly known is having a very fast gantry speed, or how quickly the scanner spins around in 360 degrees. There's also multi-segment reconstruction, but now with the new toy upstairs, you know, we have a whole new way to improve our temporal resolution, that's with dual source CT. So let's talk about the coronaries. This is just a quick graph showing you that the coronary, especially the right, is moving throughout the cardiac cycle. But again, there are two periods when it is the most still, mid-diastole and end-systole, and these are when we want to acquire our images. These are nice, ni two nice tables showing you the effect of um, 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 what heart rate can do um, to our systolic and diastolic phases. Um, as you are all very well aware of, we're very aggressive with beta blocking. Why is that? The reason is we are trying to prolong the diastolic phase. The longer we have in diastole, the more time our cameras with their limited temporal res resolution are able to acquire images when the heart is most still. And the image on the right will just show you that in general, that throughout the cardiac cycle, systole tends to be unchanged, the duration of systole. Whereas as the heart rate slows, you can see the duration of diastole progressively prolongs. And the image on the left also just goes to show you that you know at about 70, 75 heartbeats per minute, we have about 250 milliseconds in which to image. Uh, whereas as your heart rate goes down to 40 beats per minute, that this time period almost doubles. So again, <laughs> why we're so aggressive with beta blocking. This is just a graph showing you that uh, of relating our image quality to uh, uh, phases of the cardiac <laughs> cycle. And here, image quality of one, in this, by this definition here being excellent, you can tell that there are two distinct phases, again in mid-diastole and end systole, <coughs> where really the, the coronaries were most still and where, you know, 
a physician interpreting would say, yes, image quality is very good. Mm-hmm. Now, if this plays, you, it'll give you an idea of, um, yeah, okay. So, um, now, I wish this image played because it would give you an idea of how quickly this, uh, these gantries spin <coughs> around the patient. That, you know, if you didn't have the shell that covers, the, 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 you know, the guts of the machine, I'm not sure any of us really would stick our heads into this. Uh, it's quite a frightening scene. These are rotating, for example, here in it, the, these machines, are the, the, the Philips that we have is capable of rotating 360 degrees in 330 milliseconds. Uh, Really, you know, the only way you can improve upon this and why unfortunately sometimes it's hard to improve your speed any higher, uh, to rotate any higher, uh, <coughs> is because you're completely limited by g-forces. That, that they're f- they already generate up to 10 g-forces that uh, should you spin any faster, you know, the machine can literally pick itself up and, you know, uh, you know dislocate itself. Um, so. But this is really one of the primary ways that we improve temporal resolution is that if we had the ability to improve our gantry rotation time. In general, it takes about, um, you can think of it about 180 degrees in order to create an image. It's really 200 degrees, 210 degrees, 80 degrees plus the what we call the fan beam angle. Uh, but in general, if, if, you're, if you can rotate 360 degrees in 330 milli- milliseconds, and y- it takes you about um, half, uh, if it takes you half a turn to create an image, therefore your temporal resolution then is one half time your gantry rotation time, or one half times 330 milliseconds, which comes out to be about 165 milliseconds. So it's about 165 milliseconds uh, to create one single image, and that's with, the, with our old machines, that was is the uh, 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 temporal resolution. So in other words, in order for us to create a still image of the heart, our diastolic phase has to be longer than 165 milliseconds, because that's the temporal resolution of our scanner. And hence why in the last first, uh, slides, I, I told you the importance of beta blocking to prolong the diastolic uh, period uh, with bradycardia, so our machine, which has, our old machine, which has a temporal resolution, can uh, create a still image uh, with its limited temporal resolution. There are other ways uh, with our older scanners to uh, create, I- improve our temporal resolution. This is called, similar to what a cardiac MRI does, known as multi-segment reconstruction, where instead of using one um, cardiac cycle, you create an image from multiple cardiac cycles. So your acquisition time is actually shorter during each cardiac cycle, but you sum up the data and er- to make your final image. And because your acquisition time is actually shorter for each cardiac cycle, your temporal resolution theoretically improves. And this is just an example of that. This patient was tachycardic. With the regular scan, we had a lot of blurring and motion. We um, use multi-segment reconstruction, and the blur, you know, you can see the uh, blurring improves. There is some disadvantages. Uh, there's low pitch. We'll talk about that, but it is a high radiation technique, and if you have arrhythmias, it can be a major problem as well. Now, how do we deal with it? In 2015, we deal with it with something called dual source CT. Uh, these are all the hype and excitement that you're hearing about upstairs. And the concept is very simple. Instead of now one detector head, we have two detector heads. So in order to, if, if it requires us 180 degrees to create an image, you have two detector heads both at 90 degrees to each other. So technically, you only have to rotate a quarter of a gantry rotation in order to create an image. And so therefore now, your um, temporal resolution now is one-fourth time your gantry rotation time. So in this particular case, down, if it was 330 milliseconds divided by four, you're now down to 83 milliseconds. This has a really, really beneficial uh, for us because number one, we can now image at higher heart rates and still obtain still images. And number two, we can increase the throughput of our lab without Mm -hmm. having to be so aggressive with our beta blocking. 
When it comes to spatial resolution, spatial resolution on these cameras, you should know, are in general between 0 0.5 0 0.6 millimeters. Uh, there's things we can do to control, but this is mostly uh, uh, dictated by, you know, the uh, uh, the the physics of the machine um, and the actual collimators and detectors. It's a you know just a characteristic of the scanner. There's really not much more I can say about it than that. There are some determinants such as field of view and matrix size, and uh, I'll I'll discuss that with you here in just a bit. So um, so the x y the in plane resolution again I had told you was defined by um, the characteristics of the scanner. The z-axis resolution, again, z-axis is a term you guys have heard from um, uh, cardiac MRI. It's the direction, a uh, head-to-foot direction as the patient is in the bore of the camera. This is really dictated by the, the, th the thickness of the collimators and detectors. Um, and good thing is, the collimators and detectors, these have the same slice thickness uh, as your X and Y planes, so generally you're about 0.5 to 0.625 millimeters. And why that's important is uh, because if you have spatial resolution that's same in the X, Y, and Z, this permits what's known as uh, an isotropic voxel and allows you to move freely um, through multiple planes of a data without any um, partial voluming effects or, or any blurring because your spatial resolution is the same in all three planes. <coughs> very, very important point. Why CT is so powerful is because, you know, it, for example, in cardiac MRI, you may achieve, you know, two millimeter, 1.5 to two millimeter X and Y resolution. However, the Z axis resolution is six millimeters. So they really aren't, aren't able to um, uh, generate an isotropic voxel and you get blurring of the image which is not the case of CT and why we're able to freely move, you know, 360 degrees around any object of interest. There is ways to improve the longitudinal um, resolution from, you know, about points from uh, 0.5, 0 0.625. It's a concept I don't completely understand, but these, um, it's called Z flying focal spot. And I'll mention it because, you know, uh, you know, these, these new scanners are going to force all of us to learn new terms. And basically, the, the X-ray is able to very, ra as it's going around the patient, is also very rapidly able to uh, alternate between different Z positions. So while it's rotating, it's uh, imaging in two different Z positions. And the effect of that is you can improve, spa this improves the spatial resolution to almost 0.4. Um, I'm not sure why, how. Uh, I think it may be because you're gathering more data. I mean, that's the uh, you know, bottom line. Um, uh, there are t t machines out there which claim to have a even more robust X and Y spatial resolution. The GE machine, they say, has this gemstone technology, and they're claiming 0.23 millimeters. And, you know, in, in th this can be really, really helpful, you know, and for example, when it comes to cases where there's a lot of calcium or stents where you need really need to see or distal segments of arteries uh, where you know the vessel may be so small you may only have one, a few uh, voxels covering that territory anyways uh, this is just a concept of imaging that in, in order to improve your pixel size you should keep your field of view to as small as possible uh, so that's why you've often seen that when you image and you see our cardiac images you really don't see everything. You don't see the lungs, you don't see every, every because we've really combed down the field of view uh, to the heart. And what that does is by doing that, by having a narrow field of view, our pixel size, which is field of view divided by a matrix size, which is you know a fixed number, uh, improves. This is just an example of spatial resolutions of different technologies. Obviously, the best is uh, invasive coronary angiography. But you know, CT is coming there. It's, I think it's coming. It's it's going to go give its it's going to give it its run on its money. The technology is rapidly improving, and you know, uh, I've already shown you some cases that are are, are down to 0.3, and most technologies 0.4. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, coverage. Uh, 
Back in the day, there were single slice scanners, so you can understand that it would take several revolutions of the scanner to go around the patient. Now, uh, with multi-slice scanners or multiple detector heads, for example, a 64 slice scanner is almost 16 centimeters of coverage. Uh, you can understand that you require much less rotations of the scanner to image your patient. And what that means is more coverage, less scan time, you know, less time the machine is on, so less radiation. And because the imaging is done much quicker, less rate contrast dose. So a, a lot of benefits for our patients. And this is just an example of that as technology is improved from the four slice scanner, which took three centimeters in five seconds, to now our 320 slice scanners, which can cover 16 centimeters in a, s in a single heartbeat. Um, um, and, and just showing you, you know, um, uh, how uh, coverage improves our uh, imaging times. Uh, when it comes to contrast resolution, you know, really the best is cardiac MRI. CT is not that great because the difference in x-ray attenuations between different tissues is generally small. However, we do have methods to improve contrast radiation. As you were all very well know, we give ionated contrast. And that at least improves the signal from the intravascular space. Uh, there are other ways you can decrease image noise, you can do use dual energy CT, we'll talk about those things. But importance is IV contrast, it's important to optimize the proper timing, to use the right amount of iodine flux, which is the iodine concentration and the rate of injection, and to use an adequate volume. And this is just an example showing you that you know, at different ranges of KVPs that we use in our lab, everywhere from 70 to 120, you can see the attenuation between muscle, tissue, either soft or adipose, is almost superimposed upon each other. And that's why we say we have very poor uh, contrast resolution. However, the top line is iodine or iodine contrast. And you can see now your attenuation coefficient finally is different, uh, showing us that that's really th our best technique to improve uh, contrast resolution. Um, This uh, image also shows us that if you look at the photoelectric effect of iodine, that normally we image at 120 keV. And let me see if I can point that out. Yeah, normally around 120 keV, you're looking at you know a photoelectric effect over here. Whereas as you drop your kVp, you actually improve your the amount of photoelectric effect with the tissue, and you actually improve your signal by dropping your KVP. That has other side, un that has other effects as well. To reducing your KVP also increases your image noise. Uh, but this is where this is all an art, you know, by adding iterative reconstruction with improves image noise, uh, uh, you can actually <coughs> compensate uh, for that and create very interpretable images. So uh, this is something that, you know, I, I don't think we go over enough with you all, but it's nice to see at least once, uh, you know, how it's, um, um, as you increase the flow rate, what it does to contrast enhancement. Um, you can see as your flow rate increases from one to five, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bolus of contrast it, uh, is, uh, is more bolus-like, it comes in, and you get a much higher peak contrast enhancement. This becomes very important when your image, uh, and also it comes at, a, uh, it achieves peak enhancement much earlier in time. This is very important because you can imagine if we can scan in 83 milliseconds now with our new scanners, you know, one of the first questions I asked them was, does that mean we increase our flow rate? And that's, and, she, and the answer is yes, you know, so we're now be using flow rates almost six, maybe seven mils per second because uh, your time to peak contrast enhancement shortens significantly the higher your flow rate. Um, also we have different, as you know, we have different uh, uh, um, iodine agents. We have Visipeg, we have, you know, uh, uh, Omni, Omni, Omni something? Omnipeg. Omnipeg. We have different, they all, these all have different iodine concentrations. Um, uh, having an agent that has more iodine in it, you can definitely create a higher 
um, contrast enhancement. So one of the things that we haven't been doing, but I think we should consider, and those of you all who have been into the CT lab is, let's say you had a morbidly obese patient, you know, and these patients you really want to have a better signal uh, to noise ratio. So one of the things, not only sh should we use a higher flow rate, but maybe we should consider using an iodine-based agent which has more highly concentrated. And that can definitely, that, that increase in iodine flux can definitely improve image quality. Um, we are then, you know, there's also, uh, when it comes to contrast, uh, when we actually deliver the contrast, uh, there's two ways right now you guys may have seen. Uh, we use this technique in the lab. One is called a test bolus technique, which we don't, which we don't routinely use. Here you're giving about 10 to 20 mils of contrast, and you're just uh, watching a time attenuation curve at a region of interest. And really when it reaches its peak interest is when you're going to take your pictures. I think this is the way to go, you know, if you have a patient with severe tricuspid regurge or right heart failure, because with these patients you can never really predict how long it takes for the contrast to get there. So you've actually had a chance to test it before you actually scan the patient. Whereas the what current way we do it is what we call um, real-time bolus tracking, where you select a region of interest and it keep on you administer full bolus of contrast and you keep on sampling at that location with multiple pictures and as soon as you achieve a trigger threshold the the computer you know then there's a delay uh, allowing uh, where patient instructions are delivered to hold their breath the table is moved into position and then hopefully you image at, at peak um, uh, um, contrast enhancement this works very well uh, but I think in those particular settings of low, uh, um, low EFs and uh, tricuspid regurgitation, I, have, I think the time bolus method is probably a better technique. Uh, the reason is a lot of times the techs get nervous, you know, but if you have these where the bolus of contrast is not, you know, densely packed anymore, you know, because of TR, let's say for example, you know, so the, the intensity of the contrast is very low it's not, it takes time for it to reach the trigger threshold. The tech is sitting in the lab, he's watching his contrast finish. The machine isn't turning on, he gets very, very nervous and they have a disposition to, you know, turn the machine on to at least capture some images before the contrast is finished. And so we see a lot of images where, you know, all the contrast is on the right side of the heart because it just hasn't had time to get there because of this back and forth flow because of TR. Um, and timing is important because this is how, you know, uh, we just can image uh, either the left or the right side of the heart. Uh, this is just an effect of how a cardiac output does to contrast timing. As your cardiac output falls, your enhancement, you can see, uh, uh, falls, and your time to peak enhancement takes longer. Um, uh, these are just a quick review of some of the, you know, re re uh, spatial contrast temporal resolutions of the different modalities. Uh, again, invasive angiography has the best spatial resolution, followed by cardiac CT. Cardiac MRI has the best contrast resolution, and echo has by far the best temporal resolution. So these are just nice little, uh, uh, well, actually, even catheter angiography has very, very high temporal resolution. But these are, uh, uh, you know, just little good tidbits to uh, know on hand. And see, SPECT, believe it, as, as you all have seen, uh, is really the worst at both spatial and temporal resolution. So this is another very important part of my talk, uh, the different cardiac scan modes. I've had to learn number three myself. The first two you may well be familiar with. And the, the, sec the third one we've had to learn because of the dual source CT scanner. So um, um, how is data actually acquired? Well, one of the most common ways uh, is what is known as retrospective uh, gating. And the concept here, this is also your helical scan. So concept here is, as I'll describe it, is your, pati your patient is moving through the bore of the camera. And as that patient is moving, the EKG is on, as, I move, uh, uh, as the patient is moving, the EKG is on, the machine is spinning around the patient and collecting data throughout the cardiac cycle and at multiple Z-axis levels. 
and um, so and and then so basically you've acquired data throughout the cardiac cycle and at um, 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 and at multiple z-axis locations. What that allows you to do, of course, is there's benefits. Uh, you have uh, multiple phases within the cardiac cycle. You can now go back and retrospectively reconstruct images at. You have both systolic information, diastolic information. Th um, uh, the problem is because the computer is on throughout the cardiac cycle, this is a high resolution. This is a high radiation technique. Um, this method is frequently used when we use both systolic and diastolic information and it's also frequently used when we have arrhythmias because this technique is more forgiving if the patient were to have a PAC or PVC uh, for, uh, I'll show you why, uh, because of the amount of time that we sample data. Um, um, and that really, w one thing you have, we have, a term we have to introduce with retrospective gaining is something called a pitch. Uh, the pit, you can think of it as the table feed, you know, uh, you know, so uh, or the table speed. So, if I was to take, you know, if 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 you were to do retrospective gaining, with retrospective gaining, the table moves very very slowly. So in general, I have a pitch of 0.2 to 0.3. What does that mean? That means I am accumulating a lot of overlapping data. I'm oversampling an object several times. And this is why we're able to reconstruct it any phase and why it's forgiving if there's an uh, arrhythmia because I can eliminate some cardiac cycles um, where you know, the data was not necessary, w would, was, was creating blurring. Contrast to uh, a pitch of one would be a perfectly you know, a, a contiguous data where you know, by the time the machine rotated once, you know, there was no overlap of data by the next time it rotated the second time. Correspond that to a very high pitch where the table is moving so f faster than the speed of the rotation that you have large gaps in data. Um, uh, for example, with a pitch of two, and that's on the right-hand side, the top of the screen. But, um, you know, our classic um, 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 uh, helical scanning with a low pitch is something like up on top where you can see where as the machine is moving, uh, as you're moving, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of sampling data over and over again at multiple different locations. Whereas if you look at the one where there's a gap in data, you know, uh, if you have a low, if you have a high pitch, you're creating gaps in data where, you know, you just don't have information to reconstruct an image. Uh, this is important because the more time, the, the lower your pitch, the more radiation, and basic concept is the more the machine is on, the more radiation dose it's delivering. Uh, retrospective gaining, as I had mentioned, allows you to see different phases of the cardiac cycle. So not only is it helpful for ejection fractions, but in this particular case, the movement of some large object. Uh, and here, you know, it allows you to create the cine images that you have seen for ejection fractions. Um, um, this was really the mainstay of how CT was done. So people said, hey, you know, how can we improve? You know, obviously we can't radiate patients so much. How can we improve upon this? And this is where dose modulation came. So if you look at A, where we're delivering radiation dose throughout the cardiac cycle, people said, hey, you know, why don't we just deliver our most radiation at levels uh, at uh, in areas where it's the most important to us, for example, in mid-diastole. So what will happen is usually, you know, you, you'll have a ramp up of the radiation dose to the mid-diastolic phase, and then it will cut back down to a certain baseline level of radiation dose through other cardiac phases, as seen in B and, and C. And what that does is obviously it cuts radiation dose tremendously, uh, because you're not, you know, you, you don't have the full energy of the scanner on throughout the cardiac cycle, and then number two, uh, you still have images in your systolic and diastolic phases. Um, 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 the the images where the tube current is ramped down has more image noise. So usually, yes, we can not may not be necessarily able to. Um, it, uh, interpret the coronary arteries, but they should be good enough to allow you functional assessment 
uh, of the myocardium. So people took this even further. They go, hmm, so why don't we just, instead of, uh, you know, uh, having the tube current on throughout the cardiac cycle, why don't we just turn it on during mid-diastole? And hence, prospective triggering, also known as prospective gating. And here what you're doing is, uh, instead of retrospectively reconstructing data, you are prospectively uh, defining a point in the RR cycle where you want the camera to turn on and take an image. So uh, uh, classically, uh, this is called step and shoot. So if you'll uh, think with me, the table is no longer going to move in a helical fashion. It will move uh, in, a, in, in a stick, as, as what do you call it, a, a static kind of fashion. And the table will, you'll take a picture, okay? You'll wait a heartbeat, the table will move during that heartbeat. You'll take another picture. Uh, in the next heartbeat, the table will move. The following heartbeat, the the you'll take another picture. This is called step and shoot. And what you have here is you're creating, at each time the table moves, you're imaging a new uh, Z-slice <coughs> location. And then you merge these different Z-slice locations to create your final image of your heart. The greatest benefit of this <coughs> is, of course, radiation is only being delivered during <coughs> the most important part of the cardiac cycle when we want to image, which is in mid-diastole. Uh, th the disadvantage is also that we only have that particular phase of imaging. So if there's any corruption of the image because of an arrhythmia, this is a very, very unforgiving technique. Obviously, we have no systolic information, and hence we also, therefore, will not have any functional information to provide our patients. But this is one of our lowest radiation dose techniques because, you know, that data is only acquired during a particular phase of the cardiac cycle and it's triggered by the RR, by the uh, uh, R wave of the EKG. Um, there are newer machines now, the newer machines now do have some things called arrhythmia rejection. These you'll hear more about in cardiac MRI, but our scanners have it up there here as well. Um, um, where, you know, the computer based on the patient's historic R to R interval, if it detects there's been an abnormality in a particular range, um, that beat will be skipped and, you know, the heart will then image when the R and R falls within an appropriate range. Pros and cons to this, cons are that if your patient is having arrhythmias, obviously this will prolong the scan because there may be multiple beats that are rejected. Second thing is, you may have seen with our perspective scans where uh, if you look at the pulmonary artery, there's a certain intensity of contrast and by the time you get to the descending aorta, there's a different intensity of contrast because the contrast is moving as you're taking, you know, isolated pictures and then you're merging it. Uh, so there's a potential here that if scan got too long, by the end of the images, you may not have any contrast left. So pluses and minuses, but at least it's more forgiving that you know, if there was at least one PVC, you don't have a useless study, which we, uh, you know, some of our senior fellows can tell us has happened many times. Okay, so this is now, uh, we can take these same concepts now and for our newest generation uh, 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 scanners, which are really the 320 slice and uh, our dual source uh, CT machines. And this is now a combination of both. So here, because the machines have such wide field of coverages, why they, they have such fast temporal resolutions, you, the patient can actually be going continuously through the bore of the scanner, so it's a helical scan, but uh, it functions like a perspective scan that it's triggered on the RR at a particular phase of the cardiac cycle. So it has multiple benefits. It has the benefits of being a very rapid scan, and it has the benefits of also being perspective in that you can gate exact, you can, uh, you can acquire images at the exact phase that you want to uh, uh, acquire data at. Uh, this has benefits of, obviously it's a very fast scan. Uh, you have much reduced radiation dose because you know, the scan is over before you knew it. The patients are moving so quickly through the scanner. And you're con because it's so quick, the contrast enhancement is uniform, unlike what I, this uh, scenario I spelled to you before. Um, uh, the, the, the these 320 size scanners also, you know, I mean, they do things now, it's quite, quite impressive. 
they can even say, okay, so instead of, you know, if I want to improve my temporal resolution, why don't I do, it's kind of think of it like multi-scan reconstruction. I can sit at one location, keep on acquiring data uh, 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 in small periods of time and to create an image from multiple heartbeats. Um, so uh, the benefit of that is even better temporal resolution, but it comes at a cost of more radiation because you're delivering more radiation. Um, you can also now, despite this being a helical scan, uh, you can say, hey, you know what, why don't we just increase the window? Meaning, so I can, instead of just imaging at 75% phase, I can say, let's make it 40 to 75, so I can get a little bit of systolic information as well, and still be a helical scan. So. A lot, you know, the classic descriptions that we described are now being blended here because these machines are so fast, so, so powerful. Um, um, and this is just, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, going over the benefits and drawbacks of um, retrospective and prospective triggering. Now, C dual source CT is the another is the. Um, Now, dual source CT um, allows you another mode, uh, uh, the same mode that we were talking about where, you know, it's called prospective EKG triggered helical mode along with the 320 slice. And here again, the, the, you know, the concept is simple. The patient is moving through the bore very, very rapidly. And these, because these images, these machines can now image the heart with one heartbeat, uh, you can really use that to uh, your advantage and uh, uh, create um, a very uh, a, a snapshot of the heart um, uh, with, with these two techniques. Uh, you should know that uh, these, these techniques are what we know as known as a high pitch. So pitch, remember, was really the speed of the table. So that if you go upstairs and see the speed of the table, literally it's just, you know, in the, page, the scan is done so quickly. Uh, so the, the table moves very, very fast, but there's really no loss of data because you have two detector heads. So what one detector is acquiring, you know, you really don't have loss of data because the other detector will see what, it, what the first one is not seeing. Um, so really, really powerful techniques uh, which are really, really going to change the way we image patients. Uh, this is a mode called the flash, um, and, you know, this is what we really want to be able to do on most of our patients. This is called, you know, it's called the flash mode on Siemens. Here, the, you know, the pitch is almost 3.4, so very, very fast table movement. In one heartbeat, you are acquiring uh, image of the entire heart. Uh, both tubes are on, delivering ra radiation, and, uh, you know, in the flash setting, they say that you can get almost a, a temporal resolution of almost 75 milliseconds. Um, and what this means is that if you can acquire data so fast that you know, studies have shown, um, they've published studies of sub-millisievert coronary CTAs, so meaning less than a millisievert, and contrast boluses of like 30 or 40 cc's. Yeah. Uh, these are just the, um, I, I like to show this because uh, this is our newest scanner. This is just some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, specs on it. Uh, check this out. So it's 192 slices. Uh, it's actually 96 for each of the detectors, multiplied by two. Uh, rotation time, 0.25 seconds. So the other old scanners, 330 milliseconds. This is 250 milliseconds. So somehow they improved on the G-forces, you know. Temporal resolution, 66 milliseconds. You know, MRI is 50. Uh, so very, very fast. Um, full range of KVP settings, no more one at only at imaging at 100 or 120. You can now image from 70 to 150. This allows you to do dual energy scanning where you can scan, one scanner can be sending in 70 KV, another one can be doing 120. And what that allows you to do is uh, create different tissue intensities and bottom line is it's a way for the computer then to figure out what's calcium what's not calcium so you actually can peel calcium away from objects so kind of a lot of excitement on that 
They claim spatial resolution of 0.3 isotropic, 0.3, cath lab is 0.2. Um, table speed, seven, almost seven and a half centimeters per second. Uh, that's pretty, that's fast. Uh, you have to come upstairs. There's, supposedly you can move a 776 pound patient in seven, you know, in seven and a half centimeters in a second. And a gantry opening of 78. So I mean, we can now image very, very large patients. So hence, uh, those of you who know Dr. Mamarian, why he was so excited about the scanner. Uh, these are just some of the specs that go on to it. Uh, and this is just a quick slide, just, you know, going over some of the radiation doses. But that's all I got. I hope it was, uh, any questions? If you all have questions, this is a great time. If I'm unable to answer it, especially about the newer scanners, every Siemens person is upstairs from that, you know, the application people to the engineers. Uh, they know these machines inside and out. Uh, they should be able to, I mean, the, you know, this is now the time. At least come and check it out with us and um, uh, <coughs> learn a little bit more about it.